Hi, I'm Sally Glass and welcome to Art This Week. On this week's episode, we visit the modern and speak with the artist Fred Tomaselli about his exhibition, Focus, Fred Tomaselli. Now for Art This Week. Thanks for joining us, Fred. Thanks for having me. Okay, so to start off, can you sort of give us an overview of, of how this show came about, how you were approached, how the works were selected, that sort of thing? Um, yeah, Allison Hurst approached uh, me to ask if I wanted to do a show. I'd been to the museum before and really liked it. And uh, then it just became a question of, um, of, of trying to f find work that was suitable to the scale of the galleries and uh, to try to have as much variety within my um, within what I do and to kind of um, maybe go a little bit back and then and then go to the most recent work that I've been doing which is the New York Times works and um, maybe you know have them have a conversation with each other. We're standing right now in front of Flipper um, can you discuss with us for a moment um, sort of where Flipper falls on that scale first of all of you know older versus newer work, right. as well as you know, the inspiration and sort of the process behind it. Uh, yeah, uh, I think I made Flipper in 2008. I'm not exactly sure, I can't remember. But um, it was uh, made specifically for Prospect One uh, for the New Orleans Biennial. And um, I'd made two works, uh, which is just probably why I was selected for the show, that specifically addressed New Orleans and Katrina. And they were more apocalyptic. Uh, in, in, um, in tone. And so I wanted to make a work that was sort of more celebratory, more about music. Uh, and so I tend to think of these, uh, say, these small ellipses here in the center mm -hmm. as sort of akin maybe to a gospel choir uh, or uh, just a bunch of people singing and that these sort of became sound waves. So I was maybe exploring ideas of synesthesia, you know, this idea of, uh, of visual music. And uh, the reason I call it Flipper is uh, the original work was really composed of just this little um, one-sixth section of the work. Okay. And then what I did was I took this, say, bottom part here and then sort of flipped it over to oh. make a bipolar sort of abstraction. And then I took this panel and then flipped it over. And then I took that panel and flipped it over again. But it also relates to the band Flipper, too, which I was listening to a lot at the time, which is <laughs> okay. sort of a, a hardcore punk band. So, um, so that's how I made it. And something that's you know, not as easy to, to see on, on the internet when people are looking at, at your works and whatnot is just how layered they are. Can you, right. can you talk for a moment about that sort of layering process you do with your paintings? Sure. Um, uh, these are on wood. Um, panels and uh, there's this bottom layer where a lot of the collage material ends up and um, and what I do is I, I lay it all out mostly I work on the floor okay. and uh, using bridges to get out into the middle of the work mm -hmm. and um, I kind of just you know it starts out with a, almost like a, a very simple line drawing and in a funny way they're they're you know they're um, conceived in this particular work it was conceived almost as a sort of a math project of just hanging catenaries what I did was I hung it on the wall and then I just took a little pull chain from a, from a, a, a light uh, from a, a, a ceiling light uh -huh. and I made like an 18 foot chain and I would just drape it oh. and then and then just using gravity just trace those little uh, drapes uh, the, these, those those lines would be called catenaries and then um, and then I would get that sort of simple line drawing on the floor and then just start uh, embellishing it, decorating it with um, various, um, you know, uh, collage elements. And I was thinking kind of specifically, I was thinking about like Tibetan tonkas and like these garlands of severed heads and whatnot. And um, so I just sort of build all that up. I work pretty dirty. Then we um, repaint all the negative space back to black. Then we cast it in resin, which is uh, something I've been working with since I was a kid in Southern California, because everybody, a lot of kids use resin to shape boards out there. So it sort of comes out of the garage. And then um, what I do is I kind of layer up the resin and then, um, then start painting on an upper layer of resin. So there's this slight shadow play or dimensionality 
Um, you know, when you walk past a piece, you, you'll, you'll, things, you'll see images slightly shift in relation to one another. And uh, so it's sort of a combination of like the real, there's like real leaves in here, the photographic and the painterly, and it, maybe it's a little hard to tease it all out until you really look at the work. So we're standing now in front of your New York Times collages that, that you started working on, I believe in 2005. Correct. Um, can you talk for a moment, first of all, just, just how did you, what inspired you to start working with, with these pieces? Well, you know, I'm a, a longtime subscriber to the New York Times, and I'm a bit of a news junkie. And um, I mean, for an escapist or a person who who thinks about escapism in this culture, <laughs> it's kind of funny, I guess. But um, I, I guess the original, uh, the, the the earliest work would be this work over here, Bernie Ebers, uh, being, um, you know, when he was indicted in uh, or found guilty in the WorldCom scandal, and. Um, well, I was just, I was looking at the image all day. I took it back to my studio and I just couldn't get it out of my head. And, um, and it kind of reminded me a little bit, it's, you know, of um, a little bit of, of the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. Um, and I was thinking, and I had done a work in uh, the late 90s that dealt with that very subject, um, kind of cribbing from Masaccio. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was thinking like, you know, they were being driven out of this sort of Edenic world of, you know, high finance, mm -hmm. Wall Street, and um, sort of being driven out with the sort of camera-wielding paparazzi of the media. And um, so, you know, I found him to be really a loathsome individual. However, I was also really touched by the humanity of him clutching his, the wife, his, wife's hand, his wife's hand. And so I was discombobulated. I couldn't quite get to the bottom of what I was feeling like. Do I feel sympathy for him as a person, or do I loathe him as an icon of, of what turned out to be the coming financial crisis, right? Mm -hmm. So I sort of worked out my, my um, discombobulated feelings by just starting to graffiti or draw on, on the image itself. And um, that led to everything else here. Obviously, you know, you're drawing on top of the on top of the clippings and whatnot. Can you go a little more into your process that, that you do onto the newspaper? Uh, yeah. Um, well, um, I mean, basically, I, I, it's, 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 uh, it's either gouache or, uh, or ink or, or collage okay. um, that, that goes onto the pieces. I guess the thing I, that I kind of am interested in as an artist is, you know, this idea of objective reality, this idea that like, you know, the gray old lady, the paper of record uh, is supposedly what's, what's real. And, and being an artist, I'm really interested in this idea of reality and perception. And so what I thought, I guess I, I think that like, despite its, um, say it's allegedly objective uh, view of reality, it is still an ob a subjective view. It's still like the result of editing and there's this idea of what the media chooses to spotlight versus what it ignores. So I, I, th I think the whole idea of, you know, uh, an objective media is kind of complicated, let's say. So what I just did was sort of impose my own subjective reality onto this allegedly objective reality. And so, um, and I try to, I guess I, I, I uh, what I like about working in this series is that I have to respond to the conditions of the photograph and the context of the news that surrounds it. So um, each work demands that I go about addressing its needs, I guess, mm -hmm. a little differently. So it keeps me a little off balance. Um, you, you've said before that, that like Marcel Duchamp and his works, part of, part of your art is the viewer's experience. They're the ones who sort of complete the process Mm -hmm. when, when they have their own experience with, with what they see. Um, what are some other artists that have influenced your approach to art making? Well, um, a, a lot of artists that really were super influential uh, kind of uh, hit me um, and, and at a point in my life, when I was, maybe when I was much younger, where there was a real paradigm shift as a result of seeing their works. And you might not see it in these works, but I was really, um, I, I, I remember seeing a, um, a Terrell work, James Terrell, and uh, I think it was the mid-70s, 
And uh, at that point, I thought art was like Michelangelo and Salvador Dali <laughs> or whatever. And I, I ended up walking into a gallery with some friends. We were in Venice, California, skateboarding around. And, and they said, oh, there's art, art gallery. We should go in there. You're an artist. And I was like, all right. So we go in there. And it's a dimly lit gallery. And, um, and it looked like they had painted a black rectangle on the wall. And we were just laughing at it. We were just like, <laughs> oh, this is so stupid. Modern art is so stupid. And, uh, and went up to it, and, and I think I touched it, and instead of touching a wall, my hand went into limitless space. And I, went, I, start, I stopped laughing, and I went, oh, wow, you know? And then I realized this thing, I, what I thought I saw, you know, was uh, something that was not there. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I, that idea of what you see isn't necessarily what's there is, was really important to me, and I think I, I kind of addressed a similar phenomenon maybe in my other works. So, so that was really important. I also saw this around that same time, I saw Bruce Nauman's retrospective at LACMA. For me, I was just, I grew up close to Disneyland, so for me it was the Disneyland of the repressed, and that was really exciting. You know, instead of being the happiest place on earth, it was like the weirdest place on earth. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, also at that same t around that same time, I saw Lynn Folks' first show at, LAC at uh, the Newport Harbor Art Museum, All the mm -hmm. Bloody Heads. And, I really, I, I, I really love the anger in that. So maybe th this work is a combination okay. of, of those, those early experiences, but there's a lot more. But. And you, you've talked a lot about the influence of growing up in Southern California on, mm -hmm. your, on your work. Right. You, you moved to New York in 1985. Right? Yeah. Right? So, Did your homework. <laughs> so what, what sort of influence has New York had on your, had on your works? Well, I mean, for one thing, I, you know, when you grow up in a place, you don't really realize just what makes it special or weird and, uh, because you don't have anything to compare it to. So I guess I, um, when I got to New York, I realized how weird my life had been over there. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so I started like tapping into that, that dislocated reality that I grew up with in California. Um, not so much to be like a regionalist, but because I really felt like a lot of things that had been happening there were happening to the rest of the world. It was a global development uh, of reality dislocation. So just having that just sort of perspective shift was really important to the work. I got to maybe see it a little clearer from being there. Okay, well, excellent. The new exhibition looks wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. We want to thank Fred for speaking with us. For more information on the exhibition, go to themodern.org. That's it for Art This Week. Thanks for watching. I still got your polo.